In an earlier video, we looked at individual transferable quotas and a few of their advantages and disadvantages. One disadvantage being it only looks at one species at a time, which ignores the predator-prey relationships that can exist between multiple commercially exploited species. Like if this species eats this species, then if this one is fished more, it means there will be an increase in catches for this other one. Or if this species is fished more, it means there will be less of this other one. With a single species individual transferable quota, the fishermen aren't really in a position to work this into their plans. So another way to handle this, instead of giving the fishermen a certain amount of rights to a certain number of a species, set out the rights over the spaces, the habitats, or the territories. Maybe they have rights to all the fishing, or just fishing one species, or maybe just the rights to operate the tourism, or maybe they have the rights to do anything they want with the area. The idea is, if the users can make all the decisions and gain all the benefits over a given space, they will make the right decisions. What's good for the ecosystem or the fish is now good for the people that use it. In this series, we've been talking about the benefits of having a single user or a group of people acting as a single unit. They end up putting in less effort, the ecosystem ends up healthier, and the fishermen make more money because they're responsive to the health of the fish. They will end up fishing at the maximum economic yield. This is the idea of setting up territorial use rights, or TERFs for short. There's lots of examples of these TERF systems all over the world. One cool example is with the Chilean nearshore fisheries in Chile. All countries now have a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone, where that country owns the rights to all the fishing, energy sources, or other resources. In Chile, it's split up into a 5 nautical mile inshore fishery, with the rest a part of the offshore fishery. With the inshore fishery, one of the major fisheries there is the loco. It's like a sea snail-y thing that you have to go diving for. Also called the Chilean abalone. Although not a true abalone, still a very valuable species. The way their turfs are set up, a group of fishermen that are a part of a recognized fisherman association can apply for the rights to fish a given area. They can't be a single fisherman alone, they have to be a part of a group. The fishermen are expected to produce management plans and conduct yearly stock assessments all at their own expense, and they have to pay for the oversight costs from the government. Sounds like a lot of extra costs, but remember, if these activities were done at the government's expense, they would have a similar effect as a subsidy artificially increasing the amount of effort the fishermen put in. The first ones were set up by fishermen's associations, setting up turfs in the territories they usually harvested, and then others came later. Some of the areas just ended up being smaller open access situations, because despite all the planning, there wasn't enough monitoring or enforcement, or they just didn't work together well, and they still just raced to take as much as they could. Other groups formed, or continued, their organizations, gave fines if people weren't doing enough work, or even kicked them out of the group if they were, say, caught illegally harvesting. Once you've got a group actually working together, you don't just get fishing at the maximum economic yield, the fishermen can also come up with all sorts of clever little ways of making better use of the resource or making things more fair. Some coordinated fishing spots that they took turns using so that everybody got a fair chance at the good spots. Other groups pooled their harvests and shared the revenue so they were really incentivized to work as a single unit. I don't know if any of them did it here, but some turfs can set up individual transferable quota systems within them to handle how the fish are used. If they have total rights over the area, they can address some predator-prey relations. To fatten up the loco, some groups moved them to sea squirt beds, which the loco eat. Others set up marine protected areas where they created interesting arrangements of organisms for tourists to come and dive and look at. By 2005, there was about 66 of these separate areas set up, the average size being about 1.7 kilometers squared. Because they often started from an overexploited state, a quarter of them issued fishing bans in the first year of operation, and some kept the bans into the second year. 73% of them ended up taking below the biologist recommended total allowable catch. They're not all success stories, but within the first four years, the average fishable stock tripled. And then again, since it's theirs to make the decisions over, they can set up the time in coordination with buyers for when they're going to fish. This way they can pick the right times to sell and get better prices. These turfs work best with species that aren't very mobile. If the species travel and are fished outside where the community has rights to them, it may as well be open access. The fishermen are never incentivized to conserve the fish for later, but we could use the same solution we talked about in the previous video, and set up networks of managed areas. If all the fishermen are a part of the same management plan and are on the same page, then the area can have the same benefit. The system seemed pretty successful in Chile, but some fishermen opposed it, because maybe they lost the fishing spaces they usually harvested to other groups. It's hard to make everyone happy. What works depends on everything about the situation, so there's no recipes for what's actually going to work.